Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see so many happy, smiling faces here. All keen to find out a little bit about sail trim, trimming sails. Over the next half an hour or so, I'm going to do a real quick whistle-stop tour through all the various bits of string that we've got on our boats that we might use to influence um, the shape of our sails and subsequently um, how the boat actually uh, behaves. My first question really is why do we actually need to bother to actively trim our sails? Well, obviously when we're moving from a close hauled course down towards a downwind course, we need to use our sheets to present ourselves at the most appropriate angle before the wind. But that's not really what I'm getting at. Really my focus today is on about how we influence the shape of our sails when we're sailing upwind, when we're sailing close hauled. So it stands to reason that we need to change the shape of our sails depending upon how much breeze we've got. If we think about it, in less than, say, eight knots of breeze, most of our boats are probably underpowered. In more than about 14 knots of breeze, we've got more power than what we need. In other words, the transition from being underpowered to overpowered comes in really quite short order. You know, there's not much gap in the middle where everything is kind of optimal. In lighter airs, we're struggling to make power. You know, we need deeper, fatter, more powerful sails to drive the boat through the water. And in more than about 14 knots of breeze, which is only force three, we're trying to lose power. Just to make sure that our, uh, you know, our day is going okay and that we're actually enjoying sailing along from A to B. Sailcloth stretches. Firstly, as it ages, it tends to stretch in the high load areas and it shrinks in the low load areas. As a result, the cell, the, the, cell, the cell shape that was there to begin with becomes distorted. So we need to be able to manipulate the shape of our sails as they age. Similarly, just the wind blowing over the sails will cause aerodynamic forces which will distort the sails. So we need to understand what's going on in order that we can pull the right bit of string to achieve the right shape for the conditions that we've got or for what we're trying to achieve. So that's really what my talk today is, um, is, is all about. If we have a quick look at this sketch here, in the top picture we can see the red air flowing over the sail and it's attached all the way from front to back. In the bottom picture the sail is either too deep or uh, the angle of attack is wrong and we can see that the airflow has become turbulent towards the back end. So what we're trying to maintain is an efficient aerofoil. So we're going to start off by looking at headsail trim. And essentially we've got four primary controls that we might use uh, uh, to shape our sails. There's actually more things that, uh, that we could do, but... Um, uh, we'll need to worry about those another time. So I'm just going to start off by um, looking a little bit at sheet tension. One of the commonest mistakes that I see, uh, I, I would suggest, is sails, not, uh, is sails being oversheeted in light airs and sails being undersheeted in stronger airs. If you've got the right kind of sail shape, you can actually sheet a sail quite hard when it's windy in order to keep it efficient and keep the boat driving um, e efficiently. So we need to bear that in mind. And what we need to try and do is have some references on the boat for what we think works well. So for example, using the spreader tips and the shroud bases as a reference for as the sailor gets sheeted in, you'll start developing a sort of internal database of what, of what is good for you. You know, should the sail be four to six inches off the shroud base, or was it better if it's a little bit further away? As we sheet the sail on, really what we want it to do is come onto the spreaders and onto the shroud base at about the same rate as a rule of thumb. When the boat isn't going very fast, it's better to have slightly looser sheets, for example, just after attack. As I said earlier, we need to be careful about over-trimming in light airs. We can choke the whole boat up 
the air doesn't start flowing over the sails very, very effectively. If we're sailing around on, a, in a, on an offshore breeze or on a lake where there's flat water, you can actually trim the sails on a little bit harder than what you can over waves. If we're sailing in choppy conditions, we need a slightly more powerful sail, slightly sheets, slightly bow down mode in order to drive the boat through the waves. And we need to make sure that the genoa is trimmed in a way that's consistent with how the mainsail is trimmed. One of the problems, another problem that I often see is a headsail that's set for speed and a mainsail that's set for pointing. And as a result of that, the boat gets out of balance really quite quickly. So we don't want to have a tight mainsail on a loose Genoa, for example, because that will just make the boat turn into the wind all the time. So the sheet tension will become a bit more obvious when we look at some of the other um, controls that we've got as well. What do we know about halyard tension? How much is enough? No simple answer, really. My rule of thumb, particularly with a new sail, is that we're going to be using enough halyard tension just to remove those little wrinkles that are in the luff, or just have the horizontal wrinkles just visible. As the sail ages, we find that we need to use much more halyard tension in order to keep the camber in the sail in the right place. The rule of thumb about using just enough tension to remove the wrinkles is all well and good, but as the sail ages, we'll need to use a lot more tension than that. So what you need to do is actually look up the sail and have a look at where the camber is in the sail, what the, you know, the horizontal um, aerodynamic section is in the sail. And, and really what we want is the maximum uh, depth in the sail to be full, well forward of the halfway point, somewhere around about between 40 and 45%. So if we have a look at this little picture here, we've got a really nice little aerofoil section through here, as shown by these camber lines. And as we pull the halyard on, the camber in the sail will move forwards. So rather than using the wrinkles as a, um, uh, you know, as, as a given, use those as a guide to set yourself up, but actually have a look at where the camber is in the sail and use that as a driver for how much halyard tension you actually need. The other thing that happens when we increase halyard tension um, is that the sail gets flatter. The draft will get pulled further forwards, the back of the sail will get flatter, so the sail becomes less powerful. So as we get windier and we're needing less power, we need more halyard tension. The other bonus is that by pulling the camber in the sail forwards, it makes the boat easier to steer. So if we're if we trying to sail with a, a sail that's relatively round in the front, it's easier to steer the boat through waves than with a sail that's very fine in the front. So there are a lot of benefits to be had from just having the halyard tension in the right place. The next thing I want to talk about is the lead position that the sheet goes through. And broadly speaking, the continuation of your sheet, if that carries through to the luff, it wants to roughly bisect the luff, or just below halfway. That, again, it's just a rule of thumb. But of course, we need to change that a little bit, depending on conditions or what, it, what we're trying to do. If you start furling your furling Genoa, you'll need to move the car further forwards as the clue rises, just to keep it all under control. In stronger airs, if we drop the car back a little bit, the foot of the sail will, will get flatter and the top of the sail will twist away, which will also make it flatter. In other words, the sail has all of a sudden become less powerful just because we've moved the um, Genoa car aft a little bit. Likewise, in lighter airs, where we're sailing with softer sheets, we might need to move the car forwards a little bit in order to retain a little bit of leech tension and in order to make a fuller sail, which is more effective for sailing around in light airs. Broad broadly speaking, use my bisecting of the luff as a, as a, as a rule of thumb as to where the, um, the, the base position should be, the starting position should be. But with the lead position too far forwards, you can see here that that sheet is pulling directly down on the leech of the sail. The sail looks very deep in the bottom 
And if we look on the left-hand picture, the leech is quite tight. So that's too far forwards, really. Similarly, if the, sail is too, if the sheet um, lead is too far aft, if you can imagine the continuation of this sheet here, it's going to be about a third of the way up the sail rather than closer to the middle. Although this picture was taken on the dock, the head sail in this picture, the top of it was just flapping gently. It wasn't possible to sheet that sail on and have it drawing. So that sail is just going to flap around if you try and go sailing with it. It's not really doing anything at all. So the range in those two sets of photographs on the Genoa car position was only about this much. It's not very much. So that has significantly influenced the shape of that sail by doing nothing else other than by moving the car just a little bit. Um, forced day tension. Um, most cruising boats, on most cruising boats, you probably won't have the ability to adjust forced day tension, but you can probably influence it by pulling your backstay on. And what we're seeing on this picture here um, is that um, as we increase the forced day tension, the front of the sail is being pulled further away from the back of the sail. In other words, the sail gets flatter. So increasing force day tension as the breeze builds is another way of depowering your, your rig. In light airs, we need a big, powerful, deep, deep, powerful sail. So we want to encourage the force day to sag. So we've got a soft back stay. That's actually more relevant on boats that are mast head rigged. You know, the force day goes to the top of the mast. The back stay then, then is directly pulling against the force day. So it will have a pretty significant effect on what your head sail shape looks like. On a fractional rigged boat, as we'll see a bit later, when you pull the backstay on, the mast will bend, which will influence the main sail shape, but it won't have quite such a big bearing on the, um, uh, uh, on, on the head sail shape. These two photos here were taken just a few seconds apart. It's the same sail, same wind speed. Hopefully on the left-hand picture, by looking at the um, camber stripes on the sail, this middle camber stripe here is very deep. We've got a big fat sail. Literally 20 seconds later, with just a few squeezes on the backstay, you can see how flat that sail is. I mean, that is a pretty significant change in sail shape for doing nothing other than a couple of pumps on the backstay. Had I been a bit more aggressive with the backstay or changed the sheet tension as well, I'd have achieved a, a bigger range of shapes. Okay, so we'll move on to, um, to, head, uh, to mainsail trim. We've got a, a few more bits and pieces that we can play with here. So the first thing I want to talk about is main, sh main, main sheet tension. What does the main sheet do? Well, when the, when the boom is out in a downwind position, pulling the main sheet on is going to pull the boat closer to the centre line. But once the, once the boom is on the centre line, the main sheet is effectively just pulling the boom down. It's, direct, it's applying tension directly to the leech. In other words, it's controlling the amount of twist that we've got in our sail. How much tension should we have? Well, as a, as a rough rule of thumb, the base position for that sort of 8 to 12 knots um, power band that we were talking about earlier, you should have enough tension on the main sheet so that the back end of the top batten, if you sight up the mast, up the sail, is roughly parallel with the boom. So in, in the top picture, top left, we can see the black boom at the bottom. This is supposed to be a visualisation of standing underneath the boom looking up at the sail, by the way. The red lines are the battens. And we can see that the aft edge of the top batten here is about parallel with the boom. So that's a terrific base position. And in, in that mode, you've all got telltales on the back of your sail, which some people will pay a lot of attention to and get very excited about, and others don't. So in this sort of power-hungry mode, the top telltale should be flying maybe half the time. No more than that. 
In other words, the sail is at the point of stalling, but it's generating maximum power. So we've got two good guides there for how much is the right amount of sheet tension, the angle of the batten and whether the telltale is flying. In the middle picture, we can see that the sail has been allowed to twist. The top batten is now pointing to leeward of the boom. And overall, the sail shape has got flatter. So as it gets windier, we've got a flatter sail, just because it's been allowed to twist. Ditto in this, light, in this picture down here, if we pull the main sheet on really, really hard, we can actually hook the top batten well to windward of the boom. On a racing boat, like a J24 or something like that, you would see that quite often. You'd be striving for that in that, power, in, in that sort of power mode. What we'd have there is a, is a boat that was pointing very high, but not going very fast. So that's a sort of high drag mode. So there's a time and a place for it, but we just need to be aware of what kind of mode we need at a given moment in time. This is the same three shots actually, just with a, a real life sail. Uh, it's probably not quite so obvious as, the, uh, as it was in the drawing. So the, the, the next tool that we've got our at our disposal is the traveler. So the traveler essentially controls uh, the angle of the boom across the boat or the angle of the boom relative to the center line. Now, in this picture here, it's from very light winds. It's only four or five knots of breeze. Half the crew are sat down to leeward. And in light winds, we don't want too much leech tension in the mainsail. We need to encourage the sail to twist, but we still want the boom on the center line. So we do that by pulling the traveler all the way up to windward and then easing the main sheet so that the boom goes back to the center line. Now, the, the, the angle of the pull on the, on, the, uh, on the main sheet, in that instance, is across the boat rather than down. Hence, it's not got quite such a downward component in it, which encourages the sail to twist away a little bit. As the breed's build um, picks up, having the traveller to windward may not be a good thing, such a good thing. We want to keep the boom somewhere close to the centre line as much as possible, because that's going to keep the slot open and it's the slot between the mainsail and the genoa are open, and it's going to um, help us to retain pointing. But if it gets breezy, and we've got the boom close to the centre line, we might find that the boat is starting to get a bit twitchy, starting to fall over a bit, starting to get a little bit too much weather helm. So now we've got to be careful. Should we be easing the main sheet or easing the traveller as it gets windier? That's a good question. The, the, the fact is, both will work. If you rely on the traveller to depower the mainsail by moving the whole sail away from the centre line, you maintain the leech tension, which in theory helps the boat to point a little bit, but you choke up the slot between the two sails. So that arguably slows the boat down. On the other hand, if you ease too much main sheet to keep the boat on its feet, then you're in danger of the sail flapping and becoming inefficient that way. So if a sail is flapping, it's poorly trimmed. Simple as that. There is no excuse ever for a main sail to flap, other than in extremis as you're transitioning from uh, you know, a lull to a gust, for example, very momentarily. Now, the reason I put this photo on here is this was the America's Cup when it was in Valencia, and this particular boat was sailing well outside of the parameters that were agreed for sailing in that particular class of boat. So there's about 30 knots of breeze here. And that boat was chomping along upwind with about 30,000 pounds of tension on the force day, but the mainsail wasn't flogging, wasn't flapping. You can see that the mainsail appears to be backwinding, and that's quite deliberate. So what they've done there is pulled everything on really hard, but just eased the traveller down a little bit. And actually, if you look at this sort of lighter area up here, 
it's only the back three feet or so of that sail that's actually doing anything. And what it's doing is just helping to keep the boat poked up into the wind. So 80% of that sail has been scandalised. It's not generating any power, but it's also not flapping. The bit of the sail that is doing the work is the important bit. So there, we've, got the, we've struck the right balance between main sheet tension, traveller position, and overall feel and balance. So should you ease the traveller on the main sheet? Well, both will work. Find out what's, wor what's right for you. There isn't a simple answer. You know, some people will say you should ease the main sheet, keep the boom closer to the centre line. Some people will say the opposite. I don't have a firm opinion on it, but you know, try and try and reach a balance between the two, and understand that the two um, do a fundamentally different job. Vang's a bit of an American word, isn't it? Kicking strap is what I grew up with. Whilst we're sailing upwind, the Vang doesn't really do very much. Just just snub it, just so it's not flapping around. But on the kind of keel boats that most of us are sailing around on. The vang's not going to do anything whilst we're sailing upwind. It's not strong enough to, to, to exert any downward pull, significant downward pull, on the back of the sail. But if you do pull it on tight to stop it flapping around, just be mindful of the fact that when you try and bear away, the boat won't want to bear away because you can't lose tension in the leech. So we need to ease the vang in order to bear away. And then we need to pull it back on again. So the Vang is really a, it's a downwind tool. It's not, it's not doing very much upwind. Uh, luff tension. Um, a, a, as we saw with the Genoa, our rule of thumb is that we're going to pull enough on to take the ring, just about take the wrinkles out of the luff. Same rule of thumb, but actually we need to look at the camber stripes in the sail as the primary driver of how much luff tension we actually need. If you've got a Cunningham fitted to your, um, to your mainsail, it's an awful lot easier to adjust that than it is to uh, be messing around with winches and halyards. Uh, I would suggest that if you don't have a Cunningham fitted, it's a really useful tool. As you, as you increase um, either the Cunningham or, or, or the halyard tension, again, we're pulling the draft in the sail forwards. We're encouraging the top of the sail to twist away and the whole sail gets flatter. So as it's getting windier, we're just pulling everything harder. This next picture, when I first used this in an advert many years ago, I had all sorts of people writing in to me saying, how can you use that as an advert? The sail looks terrible. Look how many wrinkles there are in it. Well, this boat was the European champion. It's good enough for them. It's good enough for me. So what we got there, actually, is that they're using the camber in the sail as the driver for how much halyard tension they're going to use. And when you bear away around the corner and the whole thing becomes unloaded, all of those wrinkles magically disappear and they just turn into extra sail area for downwind. So don't get too hung up about wrinkles in the luff of the sail. What's more important is the actual aerodynamic flying shape that you've got at any particular moment in time. What does the clue outhaul do? Does anybody adjust the outhaul on their sail? Yes, good. Pleased to hear it. So the, the outhaul really controls the depth in the lower third or so of the sail. In light airs, do we need a tight outhaul or a loose outhaul? Have I given the answer away there? A lot of people would think that in light airs, we need a, to ease the outhaul to make a big, deep, baggy sail. And in less than about five knots of breeze, the opposite's true, actually. Because if we've got a big, deep sail, the airflow can't stay attached to it, and it drops off the bottom. Anyone that's flown on a plane and noticed those sort of winglets at the end of the wings, those are designed there to stop the air falling off the end of the wings. Our mainsail is, is, is similar. Because there's nothing underneath the boom, the air will just drop off if it's got too much work to do. So in light airs, we actually want the outhaul to be quite firm. I wouldn't say tight but we want it to be reasonably firm. As the breeze builds just a little bit, when we're striving for power, then we can ease the outhaul in that sort of 6 to 12 knot um, 
range, then we can have a fatter sail because there's enough, there's enough air blowing over it at that point for the flow to stay attached. And as soon as we're starting to get overpowered again, then we're going to max it out. We're going to pull it out as hard as it will go because we simply don't need the power anymore. Another question I often get asked is, should you ease the outhaul downwind? Some people think that you need a big fat sail to go downwind, and some people think that projected area is best, i.e. keep the outhaul out tight when you're going downwind. I personally like to keep it out. I don't like to see it pulled on tight enough so that there's a gutter along the bottom of the sail, so I might ease it just a little bit. But when you're actually going downwind, projected area is king. So by keeping the outhaul pulled out, we're actually projecting more area before the wind than what we would do with a deeper, rounder sail. If you're on a reach, it's a different story because you've actually got air flowing from luff to leach and that's generating power, so that's useful. Just a thought. So what does the backstay do? Do you remember the pictures that we saw of the Genoa earlier on where we had a much flatter sail on the right-hand picture uh, and a much fuller sail on the left-hand picture just through doing nothing else other than putting the backstay on. The, the same principles kind of apply with the mainsail, really. So this is a fractional rigged boat. It's about seven-eighths rigged, I think, something like that. So when we pull the backstay on a fractional boat, the mast will bend. That sucks the luff curve out of the sail and flattens it out. So again, if we look at these camber stripes, we can see quite a full sail on this side and a very, very much flatter sail on this side. And it, that's purely down to those couple of pumps on the backstay. If I pulled the Cunningham on hard, or put a bit more halyard tension on, or pulled the outhaul on a bit more, I'd achieve a much, uh, you know, a much bigger contrast between those two shapes. So we've achieved a massive difference there for doing very little. One thing you've got to bear in mind is that if you pull the backstay on and the mainsail goes flatter, the top of it will twist away. So you may need to pull main sheet on as well in order to control the twist. You might actually be wanting to encourage the twist, but you need to be mindful of what happens. So pulling one thing on might mean you have to pull something else on. So the picture on the right hand side there you know, that's going to get us going upwind in 20 knots of breeze quite comfortably in this instance. This was on, on a Beneteau 40.7, I think, from memory. So, in my whistle-stop tour, what I hope I've showed, or demonstrated, is that you can actually achieve a pretty significant range of sail shapes, shapes through doing very little, by just having a little basic understanding of what those little bits of string do. What I would encourage you to do is ask yourself some questions when, you get, when you're sailing. What does the boat feel like? Do I need more power or less power? Do I need to go faster or do I need to point higher? What can I do to influence, um, to influence what, I'm, what I'm trying to do? What can I do to influence my intrinsic reward of trying to sail from point A to point B? And if you're prepared to have a little bit of a fiddle and pull a few bits of string, you'll be quite surprised at just how much difference that can make. OK, that's just about all for me. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been a little bit informative, at least. Thank you very much.